There we go. <laughs> On that note, it's your favorite Finn boy, Donald Brown. And I'm currently where I'm usually am in the office. <laughs> um, so we currently have with us our first young leaders discussion. And we're joined by Rob Digan, who's the fifth son of the Earl of Grantham. He's going to play a leading role mm -hmm. in the next Downton Abbey. So looking forward to that. And we have Hiko Kriya, who believes Hitler did nothing wrong. So, gentlemen. <laughs> yes. Gentlemen, today we're going to talk about um, the People's Ball. What, what's the name of the ball? The People's Ball, the Western Cape. Um, what, what's well, it yeah. called? Let's just call the Western Cape People's Ball. Yeah, yeah the Western Cape People's Ball. Okay. So, maybe, Rob, maybe, maybe give me a background as well, because I. Yeah, I think, I you know, know. I, I'll start with Rob, because he probably knows it's, it the best. Um, Rob, so I'm going to give a summary of it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the summary I have of it is it's basically a ploy of white people to get rid of all the black people in the Western Cape. That That's about it. Oh, it? exactly. 100%. Um, it, it it calls for, you know, expedient mass removals, concentration camps, the whole thing. Uh, no. Uh, Look, it's 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 actually a fairly um, it's actually a very very simple piece of legislature. It really mm, I fear load shedding. Yeah, so we just lost Rob, um, and uh, as far as I know, the bill is about the Western Cape independence, more or less. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let me try and fill in for Rob. Um, so seriously, what I know about the bill, and I can be completely wrong, but what I know mm. is its intent is to determine a culture, determine the Western Cape as a separate culture. And the intent is if you can determine the Western Cape legally as a culture, you have legal grounds to secede from South Africa. So it's a first, or not to secede, to, to seek self-determination. and. Oh, there he goes. Oh, he's goodbye. Uh, okay, well, no, I, I, it's, there's, there's probably the loading. I mean, it's okay. seven past eight. So, I mean, don't be surprised. Okay. If it's I, I, I don't have load shedding issues. I've got nuclear power supplying me. I'm living in Paris at the moment. Um, but I would say this, the Western Cape is not a separate culture um, from South Africa. Reviving a pseudo-nationalism from John Maryland, which I tried leading on the website, who was a friend of Cecil John Rhodes, is not going to fly with the majority of the population of the Western Cape. It's a completely bogus claim. They're not a separate culture. And even if they were, theoretically speaking, our constitution does not allow for the right to secede. It's a right to self-determination. It was very poorly defined in the constitution. It was a consolation prize for the Freedom Front because they wanted them to shut up during the, um, the peace, during the Kudesa processes, basically. And they said, yeah, we, we got independence when they actually didn't get it. Um, so no, the, the thing is dead on arrival. It's a stupid idea. The Western Cape does not deserve independence. The people in the Western Cape, as far as I can tell, don't want it. Not that bogus poll that the Western Cape Independent, Independent Party is showing. 800 people does not, it's not a statistically representative poll of the Western Cape. Okay, and we don't even know which 800 people voted for them. The thing is very badly put together. And even that poll, to the extent we can trust, it shows there's a racial disparity there. So you're probably going to provoke the ANC. You're probably going to provoke some kind of conflict. It's stupid. Forget about it. The Western Cape does not deserve independence. There we go. Okay, so to provide a counter argument, what I know is there's two polls, and I believe the margin of error is close to 4%. So even if it's wrong, for example, um, if it's 36 or 46, it, it still proves there's quite a significant amount of people in the Western Cape that want Cape independence. It's, it's not, I think the bottom line, it's not 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 that the Cape Independence Party is getting. So there's, there is a significant amount of support for this movement. So I question the margin of error because 800 divided by the population of the Western Cape is 0.02%. That is not statistically represented. So if you tell me 4% margin of error, why is it that the poll diff in 2021 differs by something like 10% from the poll 2020? So the statistical significance doesn't even add up from their own argument, from their own poll data. Okay, it's a sloppy poll to begin with. Now, to use that, this is one of those opinion polls that are used not to measure public opinion, but to try and influence public opinion. And they might have had some success over there by trying to influence them. So, hi, welcome back, Rob. Are you, do you have load shedding? Are you on a generator? 
battery? Uh, no, load shedding ended a while ago, but I'm on a I'm okay. on one of those uh, batteries and it times out every so often, and I forgot about that. So I had to plug the router back into the wall. So I, I was we just making you... the, the argument to get you back in line that the poll that is being used by the Western Cape Independence Party is completely bogus. It's 800 people. It is not statistically significant. The margins of error make no sense because they own poll difference from the previous poll in 2020 by 10%. So clearly that margin of error is a bogus estimate. Um, if they've got no basis Wait, for hang saying... On, hang on, hang on, hang on. Could you just say that? Could you just say that again? Okay, so um, as far as I know, in 2020, there was a poll that differs where mm -hmm. the results differ by 10% from that in 2021 or something. And the previous it should, poll... should, shouldn't it? I mean, well, it, it's the movement's relatively new and it started from almost nothing back in 2020. So, so and, and within one year, you have a 10% shift of the population or did you do a bogus yeah. poll? No, that makes... No, that makes perfect sense. 800 people is representative of the Western Cape. That's... It goes again. <laughs> um, okay, so to understand your point, perhaps summarize, I think what you're saying is, for example, 800 people, it's easy to get it wrong. So, for example, I've spoken to Red Heron from Good, um, the Good Party, and he said, for example, there was a poll in this poll, it showed that a majority of his voters support good. Uh, um, excuse me, the, support, the majority of good voters support Cape Independence. And he said, because this it's such a small vote, such a small um, amount of people that the polls, it, it's, not, it's not significant. It's such a small number, like you said. Oh. So you say that number, um, it's, it's entirely possible that you polled 800 people that just luckily support Cape Independence, if I understand you correctly. Well, uh, first of all, that poll, so, if you could go into the methods, um, there's a lot of bias in that poll. I mean, I wouldn't even call it bias. I just call it bogus to begin with. Okay. Would you would you explain the um, methodological gaps to me? I'd like to hear this. Okay. I, uh, somebody in the comments said this. 800 divided by 3.2 million. Okay. That's 0.02 percent, if my math is correct. 0.02 percent mm -hmm. of a population is not representative of the entire Western Cape, taking into account its diversity, okay. its geographic distribution, its age, its race, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can't make any. You can't make any conclusion from that other than you asked 800 people and they happen to support whatever you okay. asked them. So assuming that you made a representative sample, right? There'd be a normal amount. There'd be an amount of variance, correct? That's expected. Uh, yes. Yes. Right. And how wide is that variation? Well, it depends on your distribution. Right. So you're saying that the distribution was deliberately skewed. That's what you allege, right? Well, the sample size is too small to even make to even make that conclusion to begin with. You need more people. Right. And you need more geography and you need more age brackets. You need to break it down by a lot of margins before you can even say that I've got a statistically significant sample. A good way to do it is to vote on it. And you can look at the election results and, well, it doesn't really add up. Okay. So what I would ask you is a very sort of simple thing. So assuming, so the CIP got what, like a completely negligible representation. Now, if you do, if you do a sample of even 800, what you'd expect, even in a really biased sample, if you tried your hardest to bias that sample, you would not be able to get that figure above 10%, really. Mm, so, sample, no. Depends where you sample. Yeah, no, no. You'd you'd have to you'd have to literally sample the one neighborhood where they got a seat to get that result. So the um, amount of bias that would be required to produce the difference between the representation of the CIP who is, who are well, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be horrible to Jack Miller here and say that it's badly run and that they're ideologically rigid and they're too preoccupied with libertarianism, which no one supports. Um, the difference between their representation and this sample. Now, there's no sample that has no representativity. There's no sample that has no representativity. It's impossible for there to be zero relationship between a sample okay. and yes. the population which is being sampled. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. So... 
what you really have to ask when you look at any kind of sample population is you have to ask, well, how much can we expect the real population to deviate from the sample? That's a simple question. Well, let's and look at a sample like Ed Okay, look at look pardon? at uh, hold on. Look at the results from 2020 mm -hmm. data poll, 2021 data the poll. Look at the difference. 2020, 50, 2.3 percent was against it, and then more or less 40 percent against it. So 12 percent difference in one year. Okay, that tells me you're underestimating your variance by a wide margin. That four percent is at least 12 percent, at least. Okay, so your variance is, is much wider. You, you can't conclude anything from that. It's sorry, like you're trying okay. to. It, it, it's like these climate guys that have got what temperature, one temperature date, and say, "Aha, I know what the planet's okay. temperature is." It, it makes no sense. Okay, I don't look. Um, I think those those the, things the are in very the different date, worlds. The, the question is, that you have to really okay. ask yourself is. If you're looking at a, if you're looking at a, a um, if you're looking at any kind of movement or political issue that emerged within, I don't know, a year or so of you introducing any kind of polling, you can expect very, very large growth. What uh, so as you well know, any kind of biological or social phenomenon tends to rise and fall similar to a sigmoid curve, right? Yes, normal distribution. So, no, no, no. I'm talking about the time progression. Uh, like okay. the growth the, of them, the, right? if you take a sum of a normal distribution you get a sigmoid curve okay okay sure yeah and what 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 you can expect early on in the movement um or even in the middle of it is actually a very 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 steep curve so to say that okay in a year you couldn't possibly grow by 10% is that that, that doesn't that doesn't make sense as a claim in fact, actually, with a movement like this, it's only arrived to public consciousness very recently. It makes perfect sense that it would grow that much. So what I'm saying, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to dismiss your claim that that okay, the sample's too small for you to say okay for sure. This is the amount of people. Of course not. Okay, it's very fuzzy. It's a very low resolution image. But I think that even if you take the lower end estimate, let's say you take the 2020, uh, 2020 results as, uh, as indicative of where we stood last year instead of, sorry, two years ago, should I say, instead of what we actually sampled two years ago. Um, I think you can't say that it's insignificant. Okay. And, and since then, the, 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 um, the issue has gained a lot more traction. It's gotten a lot more attention. So reasonably okay, so, so so okay so let me let me let me get to motives then because i think that's what we're getting at i think the purpose of that poll wasn't to measure public opinion it was to influence it it was a basically a at best a marketing campaign at worst a bad propaganda campaign and as of all these so ideas me, that think no no, no that's fine that's fine around. i can accept it i can accept that you don't have to argue that claim it's it makes perfect sense so in the uk i'll agree with you in fact i'll try and argue your point for you in the UK, it's 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 fairly it's fairly typical. In the US as well, people publish polls that are very leading. In fact, YouGov, for example, very popular polling, they actually change the order of the questions as people answer them online in order to lead them towards conclusions that they want to get. Right. So this is this is well known. They, they, it's well known. How do you know that? Uh, you can actually look at their because there's, yeah, I'm not. But uh, isn't YouGov I, I run by the? Yeah, no, no, no. But I mean, isn't it a state organization? No, I can't remember who owns it. I have, uh, I have no real. Uh, it's, it's the same organization that owns the Economist. Uh, I'll, so I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you another thing. example of of this, which is not relevant to either. In sure. Iran at the moment, Iran International, Saudi Arabia funded magazine, totally biased. Okay, just published a poll saying eighty percent of Iranians want to get rid of the government, and they basically ask people on the internet through VPNs. All Iranians that use VPNs hate their government. So you're ready, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just a bogus poll to begin. Sure. With. No, no, no. I, I've got you. So, I've got you. I've got so you. that's an extreme example. We know that. Right. Okay, but the thing is, you've looked at this poll. You know it wasn't done this way. Well, okay. uh, you know that. So, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's we'll start with this. You know that the poll wasn't done this way. It was told in a very, very old-fashioned way, where there's a standard fixed questionnaire. People responded to it based on the people that they sampled. Okay, it's a small number. We agree that it's fuzzy, but 
you've accepted my argument that you know movements like this that are in the early phases grow really rapidly at this stage so it's perfectly plausible that this uh, this uh, that the sample could be roughly representative okay so you have accepted that much now you've introduced an interesting point when you said that it's not based on measuring public opinion but influencing it well of course of course it is and i think i think that this is the this is the, the this is the crux of the uh, the problem is that when you speak to anyone who who uh, about cape independence and living here in the cape i'll i'll, I'll say this 90% of the people who say it's not worth trying the reason they say that is they say no one will ever support it and so what you've got is a situation sort of like you know um everybody knows it's uh, where Everyone you speak to knows it's it would be a good idea, but they think it's not worth trying because no one else actually wants it. Well, I think it's a bad idea. And then if you like... no, 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 hold on, hold, no, we can get to that in a minute. We can get to that in a minute. Let's just take care of these things in order. So, um, the idea of saying, well, actually, you know what, you guys who think that it would be a good idea to break away, you're not alone. Check out here. There's a large number of people who support you. Okay. That's not a bad idea. I think it's really good, and I think that I, I think that promoting it and shining as much light on as much support as that you can get, it's good, because it gives people the courage, to and the confidence, shall I say, not courage, the confidence, to um, to get behind the movement if they believe that it's a good idea. Now, if you want to say it's a bad idea, that's a different matter, but I think that generally speaking. If the problem is a matter of confidence, not conviction, then what you want to do is actually amplify um, the attention to uh, the attention to the issue, and you want to amplify um, the visibility of the support, shall we say? And I think I think that's that's ob uh, that should be quite reasonable and clear. Well, look, you've got the in, in a democracy, you have the right and to promote whatever idea, whatever brand, whatever intention you want. If you were intending in a liberal getting, democracy, anyway. Well, theoretically speaking, okay, you're supposed to be able to do that. Um, I still think it's a bad idea in its own merits. Let's go. Let's maybe go there. Why is it a bad idea? Well, first of all, you're trying to dream up a pseudo nationalism that never existed. Okay. There's even on their own website they refer to John Maryland's time. Hello, that guy was friends of Cecil John Rhodes. Um, no, he wasn't. John that Maryland. Guy. That's what do you mean, John Merriman? Think. Oh, Merriman, sorry, is that the guy? Merriman. Anyways, he was like yeah. a Cecil Rhodes, anyway, type of person. Yeah, no, he was an gonna... opponent. He was an opponent of Cecil John Rhodes. An associate <clears> of him. No, he was part but of. I, he was I, part of the South African I, I, party I, I, that was what, actually what, funded to oppose Cecil Rhodes's expansion. And he was also an imperialist, as far as I understand. Either way, I mean, you're trying to to revive a. Pseudo I don't think you know that. I think that I think you're making that claim. Um, you're, you're trying to revive a, a, a pseudo nationalism that never existed to begin with. Okay. Okay. Well, the thing is, no nation has existed for eternity, Hugo. No nation has, and I think that to argue that um, if any nation has prior history of sort of complexity and local variation internally, that that. Div that voids your right to independent political representation automatically, then you have to argue for a single world government um, where no one has any local autonomy. Which, or you have to argue for the complete absence of government and um, the exertion of governance by pure for uh, unmitigated force. Because or then you're saying that there is it. no, because then you're saying there's no basis for any nation to represent themselves unless they can clear out an ethnically homogenous territory. So uh, no, what, wait, I, that's, that's there's a, a concept for dealing with this. There's actually an uh, intellectual concept for dealing with this. There's something called ethnogenesis. So um, if you look at the United States, the, the United States wasn't any kind of um, homogeneous country. Even if you're looking at uh, the earliest moments of settlement, you had high degrees of cultural variation between the different English settler populations. But because they shared common interests, they bound themselves together and transformed themselves into a nation. So what you're really saying is that because of, you know, a reason that has no substance, whatever, you just don't like it. So your, your first reason, the first reason that you thought of 
for why this is a bad idea is not because it would harm the interests of the people in the Western Cape, because it wouldn't. You came up with it because you said, well, the Western Cape aren't a people and shouldn't be seen as a people. Well, I think, you know, that's, that's for us over here to decide. People. They're not an independent people. They've never been. I've got family in the Western Cape, for the record, for those who are interested. I stay in Polokwane, mm. which is in the north of the country. I've got family in the Western Cape. They're a nice, nice place mm. to visit. I actually stay in Paris at the moment. So, you know, I'm probably not even okay. South African enough to have this conversation anymore. But I like traveling to the Western Cape. I like going there, I like coming back. Uh, family, they like staying there. And I've got no intention to split my family in two because some people, they've got to be in their bonnet that they want a parliament of their own. I think it's completely ridiculous. Okay, um, yes, but you're, uh, you're, you're talking about your that. convenience. So you're talking about your convenience, your travel convenience, your personal travel convenience supersedes an existential question about existential, whether or not really? the people in this... It is, yes. It's uh, an existential no. question. It's ex why is it existential? You don't I mean, think so? No. no. For a very simple reason, yeah. that this country simply cannot survive the next decade. I've South Africa, for example, last 25 years. But uh, say, yeah, say, say Annie, sorry. Yeah. I, I've, I've been hearing Look, the death of South Africa since Nelson Mandela was no. president. And guess what? South Africa. No, no, there. no. But that's that. Look, that's based on emotional arguments. The reason I say this is largely because I've looked at um, the way the government's governing its treasury department. Largely speaking, the the issue is that. The country simply has uh, the country's in a particular kind of political deadlock. There's oh, there's an enormous amount of uh, government debt. There's an enormous amount of government spending that, pardon me, cannot be really curtailed. And the government shows no interest in cutting any of the key areas which uh, which are posing um, a threat to the government fiscus. And look. Best case scenario, we're looking at pure economic stagnation. That's the best case scenario for the next 10 years. Yeah. Well, Worst okay. case scenario. Uh, yeah. I think everyone okay. gets your point that things are going to okay. stagnate. No, no, not only that. Not only that. Forget forget the economic question. If you, if you actually live in South Africa and you know what our generation is like, the people who are actually lining up to be the next, the next generation of political leaders, they're not economic liberals. All of them are socialists. There's not one person who is to the right of the current position who has any shot of entering any position of decision making. Okay, and, and that why, doesn't why exist. Is that a, why is that a, why is not only that. Problem? Are you are, are you really uh, are you joking? France, France, France has governed a social democracy. Norway's governed a social democracy. Although France is governed as a social democracy. Okay, they, they define themselves. You've got way. a situation. Yeah, yeah. I, Your problem. I think perhaps you have Rob, a particular Rob, issue, Rob, Hugo. Rob, yeah? Rob, Rob. I think perhaps Hugo should get an opportunity to see what does he see for the future of South Africa. To to say what. I, he oh, I'm I'm actually yeah. very optimistic about the world in general because I travel to many countries around the world. I've been to about 34 countries, many of them developing countries. And if I compare the issues of South Africa, it's very similar to the issues of Brazil, to the issues of Iran, to the issues of Egypt, to the issues of some Eastern European countries. It's better than some places. It's worse in some degrees. Uh, South Africa is a developing country. It tries to strike a balance between the interests of the poor and the interests of the middle class. And unfortunately, sometimes the interests of the poor takes a little bit more of a slice of the pie. Yes, we have a crummy and exceptionally bad government. South Africa is exceptionally bad at supplying electricity. That is the big priority at the moment, is energy in general. Okay, that even succeeds the debt. South Africa at this stage, in my view, should go into debt to pay off its to get electricity so it could create jobs. The If you look at all Can't developing countries... Wait, wait. If you look at all developing uh, economies, India included, they've got a youth unemployment mm -hmm. that is horrible. Okay, that is 10, 15 percent. South Africa is exceptional worth two thirds. But either way, the, the, the issues are similar. So I think what's happening is a lot of it's South Africans are losing perspective. They're losing perspective of no, because they think they're exceptional. True. They're not. It's just not that exceptional. Sorry. Sorry, hold on. There's a question that uh, Donald's thrown up on the screen. Does the Western Cape have the economy to sustain itself economically if it were disconnected from the rest of South Africa? Probably, yes. Um, I think that perhaps yeah, ties no. to this point. If you, if so you want to answer, we have we have fairly decent, yeah, we have fairly decent gas reserves off the coast that are just starting to be exploited. We have the world's purest deposit of rare earth minerals uh, at Steenkamp's Kraal. 
Uh, we have some not insubstantial uranium deposits in the northeast of the province. Uh, we have um, a, a, a very robust agricultural um, sector that can provide food security. We've got a financial sector that's very robust and complex, uh, well, comparatively for a country of the similar makeup. Um, we've actually even got a sort of small tech sector sort of running about um, in Stellenbosch. I mean, it's it doesn't look like much on compared to first world countries, but it's not nothing. Um, we've also got some manufacturing that's not terrible. It's not great, but it's not terrible either. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fairly well placed for ocean-based trade and um, provided you can get the, the ANC and the unions out of the ports, you can actually get things running pretty well. Um, economically, Western Cape will be fine. Um, higher human development uh, level than the rest of the country. But I think I think it's really just every argument that Hugo has really presented for 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 why the Western Cape shouldn't be independent basically applies to South Africa itself. So like you know, okay, it's, it's difficult Cape, it's for part of people. South Africa. It's <laughs> right, but you're not you're not you're not listening. The the you say that okay, so the Western Cape is not ethnically homogeneous. South Africa is way more ethnically diverse and has way more political and ethnic um, uh, divisions, okay? And it has deeper ones as well. This is known. And what, and, what is the um, issue of those divisions? I don't get it. So what? Exactly. So why did you bring that up as a reason why the Western Cape couldn't be a nation? Oh, no. What I, mean, what that, I would that, say that, is in your so, own polls, I mean, it what shows I'm saying high is divisions. You don't really... Your, your own polls no, show that's... that if you try secession tomorrow, there will be violence. That is at least the signal. I'm, if, if no, that doesn't say anything. It says if you look at the that, race of the spirit, that assumes far too much. That assumes far too much. I mean, look, uh, the no, Brexit, no, wait, 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 for example. Wait, wait. Brexit had Brexit yeah. had a split that was like fifty-two forty-eight, and they didn't experience massive ethnic violence. So yeah, but it, perhaps it, you know, yeah, perhaps your, you should just explain that point. Why, why do you say there's going to be ethnic yeah. violence via this poll? Well, if you look at your own poll results, hold on, let me see if I've got it over here. Uh, if you look at the people that supposedly in favour, now that's assuming it's okay. I think the black population was something like uh, hold on, twenty percent. Twenty percent, twenty-two. Here we go. Okay, twenty yep. percent. Okay, and the rest was pretty much over fifty. I think the uh, colours was. You know, Black, whites wh whites were more in favor than the colors, but generally speaking, you can make the assumption mm. it's racial disparity. Okay, majority of South Africa yep. is black. We agree on that. Okay, if you're going mm. to secede and you have a sizable majority uh, in a sizable minority in the Western Cape, which I think is around thirty percent, if I remember correctly, of the population. Um, anyways, mm. you're going to create a diaspora basically with high tensions. What are you doing? You're recreating Ukraine. You're recreating the conditions for Ukraine to happen. What happened with Ukraine? Yeah, oh, except yeah, that there's no Russia invaded. nearby. Well, you still have a large. There's no Russia South nearby. You, you still have a South Africa, a, a larger South Africa that will react geopolitically, and there's evidence for this in the past. 1998, when Lesotho, okay, which is technically independent, even though it's not, wanted control of its water resources, Nelson Mandela, of all people, sent in the army. I think Butelezi was in control, but you know, sorry, but geopolitically speaking, there will be a reaction. Whether it's sanctions, which economically, whether it's violence. You you can avoid those stupid divisions by not going to pursue this path because I think that the okay. people who are screaming independence will be the first guys to run away when real violence breaks out. Well, that's your opinion, and uh, but there's really no evidence to display uh, to to indicate that. I think um, one where, of the where, when has succession ever been nonviolent? Okay, UK Soviet was not Union. succession. Which ones? Well, I, I would point to colonial. I, I would point to colonial secession. Well, I, I um, think more of Kosovo. Mm, that, that's my example. Okay, which was not not violence. That's that's okay. my. I think of. I I was in but Catalonia again, a few even years if, like, ago during those I'll riots. Okay, they all said peaceful. Look, what happened? Not, the Spanish government sending the yeah. police to kill a lot of people. This is Look, stupid. Hugo, I d I don't think it's impossible for what you're saying. I think I think that it is certainly possible, but I think that. Look, the consequences of remaining in South Africa is that you are going to see increased. Uh, you are going to see increased centralization of the state. You are going to see um, increased gov uh, government intervention. I mean, look, some of uh, most of the efforts, uh, most of the um, programs that the ANC has in the pipeline at the moment, like the nationalization of the healthcare system, right? You've got the expropriation bill that's already passed Parliament, is waiting for. Um, 
the uh, Council of Provinces to rubber stamp it. You've got the, um, what do they call it? The district development plan that's going to force uh, every local government to align itself with the national government's dictates um, by being supervised by national government departments, right? And what is, what is so it's going to essentially adopt... Being enforced? I beg your pardon? Of, Sorry? What are the I mean, a lot of the developing world have governments with these grandiose ideas of, of, of trying to enforce ideology onto the local provinces, and they almost all never work through the longest time. Um, so, you know, South okay, Africa... What, 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 Okay, then why is everyone complying with BEE? Sorry, sorry. Well, yeah. not everyone is, actually. Ich, Ich, please finish your point and also please answer no, this question no, I, just I to mean, give you more time. Just he's to give you more using time. the excuse hmm. of a crummy government, which I totally agree South Africa has, an exceptionally bad government, which South Africa has, as an excuse for secession, as if that's the only option on the table. There are other ways to reform yeah, well, the what's, government what's that are the, far better. So what's the alternative? Let's say you let's say you want an interracial discrimination in South Africa. Let's say you want to say um, stop the government from protecting uh, the gangs that that are responsible for between twenty and fifty percent of the homicides in Western Cape. What do you do? You can't do anything. There is no influence that any minority has on uh, on central government policy. None. But wait a minute, there are other options. There are pr there's private security uh, uh, companies that are trying to deal with some of it. Not that that's ideal, but at least that's an option okay. on the table. There is an option that even the provinces have some policing, although you know it's questionable to what authority they've got, etc. You know, um, th there are options. No, on no, the no, table. So there's also ways to, con to convince the government that it's not in their interest to get let this continue. Really? You think you can convince the ANC by rational argument that it's not in their interest to persecute minorities? It is always in the interest of governments to persecute minorities. It is always but, in their but, interest. I mean, persecution of minorities, um, if you compare the conditions of South Africa's minorities, yes, there is discrimination. It doesn't compare to other countries. Of course not. It, that's not what I'm claiming. I'm saying okay, that it's so, always something that's going to be in their back pocket. And when things go bad, as they even inevitably will, because we're very economically fragile, we're not like Japan, who can stomach a 200% uh, debt to GDP ratio, right? Ukraine couldn't even stomach, you know, like a 30 or 40% de debt to GDP ratio a few years ago before it defaulted, right? Well, now we're sitting, IMF bailout we've got, we, yeah, IMF bailout helped after the fact. Look, South Africa. South Africa is at the point where the last bailout that it got, technically, so our debt sits now. We have, uh, in the past, been able to borrow in our denominated in South African rands. Nice. It means you can sort of adjust things really nicely. Great. The last bailout we got was denominated in special drawing rights for a fucking reason, and that's because we cannot be relied upon. We are seen as extremely fragile during COVID. We touched, uh, we touched, I think it was like 85% debt to GDP ratio. Now, you can't sustain that on, 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 you can't sustain that in South Africa for very long. Now, what the happens government in will South fall Africa? eventually if, if it continues. The government will go the way okay. the other governments have gone. And um, you can What will that look them. like in South Africa? What will that look like in South Africa? Well, well a good example would be India in the 1990s where they were forced to make a Really? Because they wanted India? To. India, which has never seen a, has never seen a fraction of the normal day to day violence that you see in South Africa. Uh, have you seen intertribal and intercaste violence yeah, in India? Yeah, I want to know about that, Robert. Uh, oh, have no, no, you no, seen? Sure. Have you been it to Kashmir? Nasty, uh, but what's the home? Have you been to Kashmir? Have you seen? It's a million Indian soldiers stationed in Kashmir at the moment. Okay, this is real violence between Hindus and Muslims at each other's throats, and if it's economic downturn, sure. it's much worse than anything South Africa has seen. So no, that's, that's just complete nonsense. So, sorry, just to answer, can you please answer Robert King's point, the question here? He says, he's suggesting, I don't know if this is true or not, but you're, you're, you're saying that 800 poll representative sample is not representative of the Cape. He says a usual poll, like it seems to me, one point, between 1 and 2K is a usual poll for the, the entire South Africa. Is that representative of, of the entire South Africa? No, and, and many of these polls that News24 floats around is completely bogus if you go into the methodology. Yeah. I mean, South Africa's polling is is horrible. We don't have data on many things, just just to get that out. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> look, you can use election results, the best you've got sometimes. That's also a big issue. We don't have data, so government makes decisions on the fly. Look, I mean, the thing is, what, what I find... 
what I find remarkable is that you're saying there's no way that any of the problems South Africa has at the moment can, it can be seen as a risk to minorities. Um, there's always a risk to minorities, but again, the okay. So the how big is that risk? Depends okay. What so the risk the, is. it's never that's never a solution. So secession is never a solution to any kind of problem. Well, when inevitably, if you say succession, you're saying that you reject the South African Constitution, which at the moment does not allow for it. Oh, I do. The nature clause it does not allow. Cool. For what, since when has it, since when in what circumstance anywhere in the world in the history of the world has the constitution of a nation ever been an obstacle to secession? It's not even part of the question. Okay, but 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 I'm it's saying never been. if. No, no, what I'm saying is if you accept secession, you accept that you reject the constitution, and then you run into yes. other kinds of issues, okay? That means that like? you're, ba well, you're basically saying that all the other alternatives on the table are not to be pursued first. Name all one alternative. Well, negotiation, you can vote for another government, you can try and resolve <laughs> out the provinces. There are other options on the table. Dude, do you listen to yourself? The, the Western Cape has never voted for the ANC in a majority. Okay, and that's we have no, a good we can't thing. tell them what to do. That's right. a good thing. So the, the Western so, but it doesn't Cape matter. Is government. No, it doesn't matter because when we ask for powers, when we ask for local devolution, we get the finger. So what yes. we're doing now with this People's Bill, which is the topic of this discussion, is we are ticking a box by declaring ourselves to be a separate people from the rest of the country. We're ticking a box that is that sits on several international treaties that the ANC has signed during the 1990s, the UN, the AU, several other bodies. Not right? the International Criminal Court. And this treat. What do you mean? Well, the ANC wants to withdraw from these international treaties, so I don't know how much. Yeah, it yeah, but the, uh, they can withdraw from the International Criminal Court. That's not the point I'm making. They've got several. It's several. They're not going to withdraw from the AU. They're not going to withdraw from the UN. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Okay, so international law has a privileged place in our constitution. Okay, and by declaring ourselves a people who have separate interests from the rest of the country, which is demonstrably true, then we get under these treaties the right to demand certain devolved powers. This is an intermediary step. This is not secession. This is saying, look, we recognize that we have we want different things from you. You guys are running things badly. You guys are discriminating against us. We would like to run our own affairs, right? Okay, but wait a minute. You're That's making all, a claim. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. So he, we are actually following all of these alternative options that you are uh, that, that you're trying. For decades, people have been trying to use the courts to prevent racial discrimination, to get the government to be held accountable. For decades, okay? People have been paying for private security for decades, We've been people. People have been retreating. There's been massive white flight from the centers of cities for decades. Okay? White or middle class flight. Both. It doesn't matter. But they show answer. These My are middle class is, aspirations that are being projected as white aspirations. Okay. No. 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 To say that because the only people who have the power to act are the ones who are acting doesn't mean to say that it doesn't affect people who don't have the power to act. You're going to tell me that the poorest muhu is sitting in, uh, sitting in, you know, Grassy Park or uh, Lavender Hill. It isn't in their interest to escape ANC government. They don't have a choice. They can't do anything about it. Okay? They can't flee to somewhere that's nicer and quieter. If you are poor, you have to live in the areas which are govern uh, which are infested with crime. That is simply the option in front of you. This is a silly argument, Hugo, and you know it. Look, we have tried everything. Just, okay. We have no, tried everything. I don't understand rub, rub, your argument. Rub, rub, rub. Go ahead, Hugo. No, I, I mean, you're, you're making an argument that the aspirations of the Western Cape is somehow different than the aspirations of the country. If you look at things like crime, if you look at things like electricity, like service delivery, all of these things, these are complaints that the entire South Africa has, right? So you're not a separate, different people that have somehow dreamed this up. I okay. think actually you would argue it's worse in many places in South Africa than in the Western Cape. Sure. And that's, that speaks to historical development in the government you've got. So okay, that doesn't so make your solution. So, look, the has more of an interest in escaping the ANC than the rest of the country, but they vote for the ANC, so they deserve it. The and Eastern Cape, the same.
If they keep voting for the ANC, they deserve what they pay for. Okay? Now, what I'm saying is we don't want the ANC. We have the power to escape them. Okay? The rest of the country doesn't want to escape and can't. So this is the this is this You're is saying tough luck to the rest about. of the country no yes they vote for this they clearly don't care well if you they look at the reasons why they future. vote for the anc and this is measurably objectively no, here's an interesting thing you okay no no, no go go ahead. okay the reasons why many no, people please. vote for the anc and many people don't want to hear this okay this is the reason why people support the government of lula in brazil that's just as horrible okay why people support the governments of iran and of india and etc i can go on with the list it's because their lives have measurably improved under anc rule that is objectively measurable in terms of access to electricity in terms of water because if you had nothing before and you have something now you've got it what defeats anc rule is the same thing that forced almost forced robert mugabe out of power which is urbanization which is cosmopolitanism the more the economy develops the more people go to city the more tribal and traditional mythological bonds break down and that ultimately will yeah. swing the vote against the anc so you need to develop the economy it's the economy mm. stupid okay it's not run away from the economy no just, just appear and i'll tell you why peer, exactly peer, rub, 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 rub. Mm. just peer out of interest Ihu. um and i'm mm. trying to find creative ways to give you more time here because rob is dominating here with with time um but not argument uh, um um yeah no yeah i'm yeah i'm not making a, a case for the argument just okay whatever why do you think Colored people, for example, are supportive of Cape independence. Um, uh, uh, presuming the poll is correct. Okay, yeah, yeah. presuming okay. the poll is correct. Well, for one thing, the colors are a minority, and they've historically been abused by whoever was in power. The black population to get into power, you use them as. I would say prostitutes, and so that the apartheid government. So they're being abused again by people who are secessionist minded. It's very easy to exploit the anger of minorities. Okay, that's okay. always been the case. But don't think I'm a box. No, wait, wait. So okay. no one else is being exploited. Black people are smart when they vote. Colored people are stupid and uh, stupid when they vote. Right? No, I'm, I'm just saying you're exploiting minority divisions. It's not very difficult to do. Uh, the okay. black population. Does so the, same the thing. Eight, so the people who vote on economic reasons, not on racial ones. Um, yeah, I would say the colors do vote on economic reasons, but I would say the demagoguery is making, um, it's tilting that vote. Okay, so which worse. is it? So which is it? So because when you're talking about people voting for the ANC, you're saying they're voting because they're smart and they understand the ANC is offering them a better life. When you say that the colored people vote for the DA, you're saying it's because they're being uh, used and abused. Um, I would say that a certain section of the DA leadership has abused them. Okay. Okay. But no, I would say that. I, I, no, look, wait, 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 wait a minute. That. Wait a minute. I would say, though, that their lives are measurably better in the Western Cape. So there's a rational reason to vote for it as well. And it might be a balance between the stuff of the sort. Okay. okay. Um, but uh, historically speaking, it's just a historical fact in South Africa that the colored vote or colored population has always been sort of a victim of, uh, yeah. you know, other interests. Okay. Whether it was True. the British interest, the Afrikaners, or whether it was the, the ANC, it's no different. Okay. And the ANC True. has actually failed in many ways to exploit them because they were just so bad at, at managing them. They were horrible when they managed to the Western Cape, you know, when the NC had control over it. Okay. So the colored population rejected them, and it's their right to do so. So I'm, I'm not making, you know, a question. Yeah. Uh, argument but you are making agency. the case. But you are making the case that if we wait long enough, we'll get a liberal government that will protect minority interests. Oh, well, why do you think I care about minority interests in general? I, I, I think it's misplaced. Okay, so my, any any ethnic minority in a country is a, is a moral externality that should never be considered. I mean, I don't even know what you mean by minority interest. Give me a practical example. An ethnic minority, yeah. their interests should never be considered. This is what you're saying, right? Well, what? Is, how do their interests differ from the interest of they always to be differ. more prosperous? In every country, a lot of it is a lot of it comes down to economics. A lot of it comes down to economics, frankly. Okay. And uh, we all have similar economic aspirations. Again, what I say is the, the the forces that ultimately defeats this type of tribal mentality. Okay. Then why? Africa then why do? Then yeah. why do go ahead, the go ahead, ideologies? Sorry, sorry. Rob, 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 Rob. Go ahead. No, I'm saying, I'm saying the argument that he's missing here is that of economic development. As economic economies become more cosmopolitan, okay. these type of relations break down. 
Okay. okay and then that's, not what, become... that's not true, though. But that is objectively measurable. No, it's true. demonstrably untrue. What? People, Why... in city, people in cities tend to be more liberal. Okay. It's no, no, no. Ethnic, ethnic groups, and not even ethnic groups. Take, for example, France. France is a fine example of this. The areas that were occupied by the British 600 years ago vote for Macron. And the areas that were under French dominion at the time still vote Marine Le Pen. The lineup is miraculously extraordinarily similar. The areas that vote for the left-wing parties are the places that were under the commune occupation in 1871. And the areas of Paris that don't vote for left-wing parties were those that were outside that control. How come those little watermarks from centuries ago remain prevalent for political decisions today? And this is not even ethnic divisions. These are divisions that have nothing to do with ethnicity. These are divisions that have to do with political control. For example, when Libya split, it was split evenly into Tripolitania and um, what's the other bloody thing? I can't remember. Somalia, when it fell apart, who what states emerged from what states emerged okay, from the collapse? Well, 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 Somaliland, all, Puntland. Somali hold on. Somaliland and Puntland? What were they before Somalia was a country? Uh, you know, generations before anyone remembers. Before living memory. They were the Majatine Sultanate, is now the Puntland now. It's its own functioning state. British Somaliland is now Somaliland. Okay, these are this is a functioning state. Okay, so right? Malia is not a cosmopolitan society. It's not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying. Try and pay attention to what I'm actually saying. I'm saying that not even ethnic divisions, which are impossible to erase when the difference between the ethnicities are visible in the street. Okay, I can't walk out and pretend I'm a black man. I cannot do that no matter how hard I try. I can learn That's Zulu. I can tried. follow... <laughs> well, I think no, if, you learn, if you learn if you learn Zulu and you speak it fluently, they'll accept you. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can. Uh, well, I mean, you can ask Neil Alcock how that went. Oh, the Johnny, what's this guy who died recently? Um, look, no, Halliday or something. What is this guy? Wow. He's saying Zulu. Anyways, um, okay, but no, no but I, my, I mean, my my I, point I is that it remains true that yeah. minorities vote for part, in South Africa racial lines align with party loyalty that remains true that remains true and if you can look but at the they, few they times also that... reflect social economic development um so you know you can make that argument that's a cofactor no, it is a cofactor you're absolutely right you're absolutely right you can't erase that okay and if you look at middle class aspirations again you know we know that white graduates for example and black graduates are leaving south africa at the same rate these are middle class aspirations do you think the black graduates said oh i love i prefer nc rule no what is happening in south africa is there is no political expression for middle class no, the, aspirations. The, the one the one study that that actually looked into both voting and non-voting preferences across uh, across age groups demonstrated that the younger um one is the younger one is more likely, regardless of race, actually, interestingly enough, the more likely one is to vote for the EFF or the ANC. Is that, now, that's is that, not because, that one of yeah, those I'm afraid so. Is that one of those 800 number polls again? No, it was a bit bigger than that. It was, I think it was about 6,000 I, I, people. I, 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 don't, I don't buy it. I, I don't buy it. it. Anyways, I, I just make the argument if South Africans care about the issue, they would not pursue avenues like this that is, in my view, futile. It's not going to work. Even if it works, I, I think it's economic suicide for the country. I think. Wait, explain that last bit. So even if it works, it's economic suicide. Well, if theoretically you can get the Western Cape to vote away, I mean, you can have violence and that will be economic suicide because violence okay. will come with economic repercussions. Okay. And again, I don't think any of the guys saying it because they all tend to be middle class people are prepared to stay in the country to fight and die for the Western Cape. There is no army of the Western Cape. There's no identity of the Western Cape. Um, and there's not even a strong South African identity for that matter. So, you know. Okay. Uh, but there is strong. Just to to elaborate on that point, I would be interested to know. Um, it seems like you're suggesting if we can look to raise everyone's living standards, I mean yeah. the voting patterns will change as well. I mean people will start voting in the right way. How do you see those living standards being raised? Well, at the moment, South Africa, um, it, I mean, 
it's a lot. I mean, you ask you, you should ask this frankly to an economist. But um, the, <laughs> the the best way to raise the living standards at the moment, South Africa, what South Africa needs, economically speaking, is electricity. It's power. Everyone knows this. Okay, and that is coming through decentralized solutions because the government is useless in delivering it, unfortunately. Okay, so you need to create jobs. You need business. Mm, well, how's that? Business. How's that turned out? I mean, there's. Uh, you remember recently there was a court case in in the Free State where. Uh, a town provided their own electricity via, via solar, solar panels, right? Yeah, I remember that. And um, they were told they had to shut this down because it was competing with ESCOM. Yeah, you, you're going to have that those type of resistance, but you also have people breaking okay. the law. So I, I, sure. I encourage civil disobedience when it comes to generating electricity. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, but that's not going. To, that's not going to do much for your industries. It's not going to. You know, well, uh, that's, I mean, that... South, South, I'm not even sure if South Africa can absorb people into manufacturing anymore because our age of the of ah, the okay. So you're saying that it's impossible to develop the country, but that's the only route to actually fixing the country. But we need to stick mm. with this country that's not fixable because reasons. No, I'm saying if you're going to pursue a technological manufacturing expansion like China, that you need, you don't have the infrastructure at the moment for that. But there are other avenues. Okay, so to that's do so. not possible. Okay, there's a service sector expansion that can come. Okay, so how are you going to get people into this service sector? As people move to cities again, their life changes. Actually, you can measure this in South Africa. If you take a measurement of any item in your home, whether you're black or white, and compared to 20 years ago, you're better off, economically speaking. Any item okay, in your home, I guarantee you you're that. So on a microeconomic level, five years ago, okay? On a microeconomic five years level, ago. everyone is better than five years ago, yes. No, that's not true. Or you can look at... No, no, no. Living standards, living standards have measurably decreased in the last five years. It's this is it? just, yeah, they have. No, I mean, I, I, I then it would be. A they've decreased anomaly. in Johannesburg. They've decreased in Durban. They've decreased in Bloemfontein. They've decreased in the countryside. The only place that they're not decreasing is in the Western Cape. I would love to know how they measure those standards, but anyways. Okay, then how are you measuring it? I look at items of people's own. I told you. And if you look at whether people are so, you, so wait, 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 wait. So you took a representative survey sample of everybody's home. Well, the Free Market Foundation looked at this some years ago, and they concluded that way. And it just ties in with what happens internationally. So anyway, the, the whether the five years are better or worse, let's make that. Let's say you assume you're right, five years is worse. On a twenty-year average, you're okay. I'd so say the, ten the, years lost. Uh, ten the, years is when well, we hit the pivot. But the, the curve is still going upwards in some ways, but it is a fluctuating curve because we get bad governments. But the point I'm making is these are economic issues, okay, that can be solved through sensible economic policy, which is okay. what, what are those policies? What is uh, 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 what are those policies? Yeah. Well, as I said, first supply, get more electricity on the grid. <laughs> That's the most obvious one at the moment. But I, I equip a bunch of economists. You know what? I would say even have an IMF bailout because if the IMF manages the economy, it's a lot better than the ANC. You know, oh, that's that's nice. But my question to you would obviously be, how do you get um, people who think like you in control of the country? What? People, I, I would say, try and vote, try and find avenues, try and do it in the private sector, because if the government doesn't change it, there's other okay, options. So They're not perfect options. Have you, have, you see, have you seen private sector behavior in South Africa? What do they do? What is their tendency? They comply with everything. And then they break the rules as they go after they complied. That L uh, uh, like whom? Well, I mean, you had, a lot of these, of you had a lot of these BE front companies. You've got the corruption, in my view, is an operations cost in South Africa. It's an operations cost because the cost of regulation is too high. So that's a good sign, usually, mm -hmm. that um, you know people have to break the law to make things work. And that's not an ideal situation, I agree with you, but that's the world you live in. You know, and you think it's enough are. to achieve what, like three, four percent annual growth? No, GDP? well, I, I mean, I would hope that South Africa gets there, but again, you know, our electricity deficit is so high at the moment. I don't think it's right. going to happen anytime soon. Correct. But that's more. It's more plausible than having an independent Western Cape that succeeds economically speaking. So it's more plausible that the ANC decides tomorrow to adopt best economic practice. Yes, that is much more plausible than having in the How? How? It, it, I'm trying to imagine a scenario in which this could happen. I, I mean, well, really, the ANC, I mean, the ANC has me been, out. I mean, look, if you're asking me to defend the ANC's policies, which um, 
you know, it's all bad from the get-go. But at time, they've had during their past periods had policies that were better than what they've got now, right? Mm-hmm. They were flexible, actually, in some ways. So, you know, I'm not even giving up on that, but there's also a possibility of them being displaced from power in certain provinces in more than just the Western Cape. Ichu, um, please answer this question that Andre is stating, asking, um, what is your opinion on BBBEE? <laughs> so many letters. Broad-based black and economic ANC, empowerment. Okay. Yeah, and the ANC in general. And uh, yeah, Rob, I'll also I'll give you an opportunity to answer that question. Go uh, ahead, Ichu. Well, the, the ANC in general, let me start with that question, acts like a typical liberation movement did in many countries across the world where they just suck at managing stuff, okay? Um, they, they can't manage any economy and it's going down. And that story of liberation, you know, is sort of running out, but they did achieve a few things, right? They are measurable successes. And I suspect that's why their voter base is strongest in rural areas. Because if you didn't have electricity 20 years ago, now you've got electricity half the day, that's a better trade-off. Right, so some people's lives have improved under the ANC. It's definitely not been the lives of middle class people. Okay, they've somehow improved, but not as much as other people. Um, but they've managed, as I said, electricity, the state-owned enterprises, into the ground. There's a lot of criticism against them. As for BE, I just find the whole issue uh, repugnant. Um, first of all, I am married to a woman that's in the Middle East. If I have a child, they will be colored, theoretically speaking. So in other words, and I'm Afrikaner, I went to an Afrikaner school, so I don't even know how to classify myself according to those ridiculous categories. And I've been a big critique. I mean, if there's original sun in the new South Africa, it's to maintain the apartheid era classification system because it's doing enormous harm on a societal level. And the ANC actually knows it. And with that comes the stupid policy of transformation and its BE offshoots. All of that, that whole ideology has to be discredited. And I think yeah, but that's not possible. I think it's discrediting itself because the ANC is running that's out not of possible. steam. The story is running out. No, but you, okay. The reason I say it's not possible is for a very obvious reason. So, if you speak to people who are educated in South Africa, all of them support racial discrimination against white people. All of them. the The number of people who don't is so small; it's it's not worth talking about. Um, I'm not sure about that, but okay. Okay, um, there are no people outside of the DA. There's no organization, there's no prominent thinker, there's no journalist outside of DA voters and the DA itself who support an end to racial discrimination in South Africa. Everyone thinks that there should be some form of affirmative action. Everyone thinks that there should be some... Look at all of the parties that are competing with the ANC. They say, okay, BE is bad, but what we really need to do is just try a bit of a different kind of BE. Okay, but uh, right. let me let me let me respond. And to then that. You, hold hold on. So there's it's not even that it goes deeper. So you look at someone like let's say Sungeso Zibi, who's the most liberal of the um, the most liberal of all black politicians. His position is okay. BEE is wrong, but we can't go to non racialism. We still need affirmative action, even in company ownership. Okay, and he also says uh, so. Basically, he says BEE should continue. Um, and then he says, uh, and I spoke to him personally by some f- incredible fluke. I got on the same uh, Twitter space and I asked him, so, okay, we have this current trend where if we don't cut our spending by an enormous quantity, we are going to have a- head for a debt default restructuring, IMF bailout, all of that. And um, that's obviously going to mean mass violence in South Africa of an extraordinary quantity. And if you're looking at twenty, uh, if you're looking at the the riots twenty twenty one as an example, it's going to be racial uh, attempts at racial pogroms, right? Mm-hmm. So, and then he says to me, "Okay, look, that's all well and good. Sure, the country's going to break, but we can't stop um, funding poor people we, uh, because they need the money." And we can't privatize the state-owned enterprises because no one wants the toxic assets. So we, we're we going to go same speed ahead, okay? And he is the most right-wing, economically speaking and socially speaking, of all possible black leaders. Well, uh, that is what... And here, no, no, here's another... Okay, okay, well, okay, okay. okay. Let, me, let, me, let, me me respond. Sorry. let me respond to that. First okay. of all, as for BE, it is destructive because it's a rent-seeking policy. It's a Byzantine-type of economic model, okay, where the Byzantine elites took 
certain sections of the economy for themselves. The ANC is doing the same thing. So it's nothing new, historically speaking. It's um, not helping the average black person. It's probably harming them. Um, but then, you know, if you compare affirmative actions across the world, okay, and Thomas Sowell wrote a very good book called Affirmative Actions Across the World, okay, and you actually look at the actual impact on the minority population, economic development, you find that often there's no impact whatsoever, right? This is a point that needs to be raised. Um, the white population have found for themselves spaces in the private sector, okay, where they can evade PE, where they can do alternative things. Has the white income declined in the last 10 to 20 years? And the answer is probably no, okay? For the colored income, it might be a little bit different. I would concede that, okay? There are some minorities that are hit harder than others in South Africa. But it is a question of expertise and, uh, um, you know, basically how much skills you've, uh, skills you've got. Because the assumption okay. of the is that we all have the same amount of skills. We don't, right? So they found pl find places for themselves in the economy where they can be competitive in. And actually, that's my advice to any person in South Africa is don't look for politics as your first avenue. Try fight a route where nobody else. Do what the other guy can't do and make yourself indispensable to the system. And we, I've seen okay. a lot of that in South Africa, a lot of entrepreneurship. I mean, the Afrikaners in the, um, you know, before 1994, I mean, my father was working basically for a state-owned company at the time, and my mother was a housewife. They were forced into their own companies. It was painful, and they managed to be relatively successful in what they were doing. A lot of That story has repeated for so many people. So that forced the Afrikaners to be economically innovative. So in a sense, okay. sense you can so argue then, they are beneficiary of no, wait, being. Wait, 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 yeah. Uh, how would that's you an answer, argument Joe? for yeah, discrimination uh, against Jews, isn't it? No, no, no. Uh, no. Well, you can, uh, Jews are a very good example of the Chinese in Southeast Asia. Despite discrimination worldwide, the Jews were prospering. It doesn't justify discrimination. It just you know, gives you a sensible thing of the analysis. Okay, yeah. I, I think these redress policies, I mean, they've been proven across the world to not do actual redress. So the black elite, why do they believe in it? Okay, those that you've spoken to, because they benefit from the system. It's like these spectral states. You can't convince them to go for solar Correct. wind because that's where they make the money from. So, but if, I, I so would if answer it the the question, how does one? Uh, I can talk over you all I want. How do? How would you answer joking atheist question? How does one address the past without redress? Do you think um, it's not possible? It, well, I mean, France, for example, has affirmative action. Um, it's just done on social economic basis. It's done on class. It's not done on a racial basis, but on a means and income test. But even here, it's quite um, questionable if those policies work. Okay, But it's a much more moral policy to do it on the basis of your own income, which, by the way, in South Africa will be 80 90% black. If we do it that way, you'll probably help more people in the process. Um, so that's a way if you want to justify it on a moral level. But then there's a question of does it actually work economically speaking? And that is not obvious to me. There's a very good book by, written by Walter Scheidel called The Great Leveler that goes into the history of inequality. And despite government policies worldwide, inequality has gotten worse. In the United States, whether it was Democrat or Republican, more BE or less BE, inequality has widened despite the government. He's sort of shown that. So it's questionable if government can really address inequalities, okay, to begin with. If you're talking about redress the past, what do you mean by that? Well, let's look at statistics when South Africa got um, democratic, quote-unquote, in 1994, okay? Black literacy rates was relatively okay at the time. Okay, but there was an, a lack in black um, education at certain levels in the economy. A lot of it came down to, to education. Then it's a question of ownership. How do you help them to you know get up to these? These are uh, to get get on their feet again. These are difficult economic uh, questions that I don't think we've had in South Africa because the assumption was if we just throw money at the black population, which ended up being a black elite, that will help them. It didn't, you know, and nobody wants to admit that obvious fact that if you look at inequality in South Africa, it's gotten worse in many ways since the end of apartheid. Go ahead, Rob. No, it's just this is sort of a bit off topic, and I agree with what Hugo is saying here. So, I mean, like, there's not much to go on. So, um, it's, it's kind of not my point. What I'm arguing here is that South Africa as a country is not sustainable. And, you know, the economic programs cannot be turned around because there are no elites that can be introduced into the system by any means um, that wish to turn it around. Well, I've been odd. hearing an argument of that type for the last 25 years, and I think after 25 years, we'll hear the same thing. Maybe the country will just drift in its current direction. And again, if you take this argument and you are living in um, Brazil or in Iran 
or in um, uh, India, you hear the same thing. Actually, India is a little bit more optimistic okay. now because they've had economic growth in the yeah. population. But generally speaking, if you are in these developing countries, people say the same thing. Egypt's the same story. The country's mm. going to hell. We're all going to we're all going to die tomorrow. And guess what? The apocalypse never comes, and it never came in South Africa. Okay, let Rob finish this point. Sure. Yeah, I mean, part of my part of my the reason I think the way I do is that okay? So take a, take if you take the OECD countries, right? And you look at the percentage of G, uh, GDP that is state expenditure over the last hundred years. So there's a very famous graph. You can just look at it if you go if your searchers just go into Google Images and go. OECD uh, GDP uh, government expenditure. And one of the graphs will be, it, it'll look like a little line that starts to climb uh, at a geometric rate. And so, you know, in the 1920s, it was not even 10%. Now it's about 50% everywhere. And, you know, inefficiencies, um, growth rates, everything sort of stagnated as, as a result. Mm -hmm. And we've got a political culture in place, which Hugo sort of agrees with, which says that we should never, ever decrease. Um, hello, hello guy next to <laughs> <laughs> uh, We should never, ever decrease social expenditure, you know, because socialism is actually fine and good and doesn't hurt anyone. Um, you know, but the problem it causes for the fiscus is something that, you know, you're starting to see in places like the UK where, you know, quality of life is declining and it's never going to get better. Never. Uh, no, never. Um, because, and for, for the same reason in South Africa, and that is that amongst anyone who's got any political influence, there's a certain moral culture in place. And that says... If you cut spending on the poor, if you cut uh, government spending on departments, all of this is cruel and immoral. You can't cut spending. So you can keep it the same <coughs> or you can increase it. Those are the only two options. And that's kind of been in place for a very long time, generations now. And I mean, now we have a word for it. We call it austerity. Any government cuts are called austerity. And austerity is always bad because it's painful. So you have a situation where you can only increase spending. And this is, this is, this is what happened to Greece, um, is they went into a situation where every government who comes into power, you have democratic competition. And the only way you can democratically compete in an effective way as a party is by offering bigger government largesse to both corporations and ordinary voters. Um, and you can't decrease it ever unless it's imposed on you from outside. And when it's imposed on you from the outside, everyone takes a massive, painful haircut. And there's riots in the street, and people get killed, and social chaos. And the problem is now we're heading to a position where everyone's headed for that ceiling now. Um, and whether or not we hit it in the next decade, two decades, three decades, is a product of how much sort of latent capital both human and material is in the economy so let's take some you know it, it, it just it's... sounds to me rob like another end of the world mm. prediction and i've heard a lot of them and i just don't buy it okay um but you, your I, position is that nothing ever collapses nothing ever falls apart everything always increases in a positive way well, forever Zimbab there's nothing Zimbabwe, that can break it down Zimbabwe clearly fell apart and that's probably still a scenario for south africa but there are other options as well again india in the late 90s ran out of steam it was the party of gandhi the guys who were socialist to the floor that had to was no not, to not, not the late 90s the late 80s and what they did following 1981 yeah, is they about they abandoned the they abandoned the license raj and they freed up the economy sure the same happened with uh israel in the early 80s they abandoned their sort of hmm socialized economy and the the free market system took over and they did really well i'm not saying it doesn't happen ever okay but, but that, that's something they work for i mean that's that's an answer i mean i think personally the ANC will run out of steam they already at the end of the ideology 
I, I don't. But there's see... no one to replace. And if you are, look at the competition, just empirically on the ground here, just for okay. real in real terms, there is nobody else. There are only people who want to replicate ANC policies. There are no alternatives. No, I, I, I don't buy of that. I don't think the DA okay. policy. So let's take the DA. No, wait, 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 let's wait, take wait. the DA. Give, give, give you a chance. Go no, I, I, I just yeah. think, I, I just think. Well, I mean, all of this is put in a broader sense. I think this is all doom and end of the world scenario speaking. There is still possibility for reform for like what South Africa is asking for. What Rob's asking for here is not actually secession. He's asking for economic reform. No, I agree. We need economic reform. Yeah. We need sensible policy. And I would say the first starting place that the ANC does not want to look at is how destructive BE has been in general for the economy. And it's been the most destructive for the black population of South Africa. So if they but really they cared care about them, they would, yeah, but the black vote needs to be exposed to this. And they are being exposed to it. They're also asking questions. Why are these guys getting all these business deals? Why is it that Cyril Ramaphosa is one of the richest guys in the country and his brother-in-law is the richest guy? I mean, that's a oligarchical feudal system that we've got hmm. in South Africa at the moment. Yeah, that's a we've got the, that's we, 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 no, I mean, look, we've, we have the okay, same but, oligarchs but running my, the show here for the past 100 years. Expose it, propose a sensible economic alternative for South Africa. And I don't think the reforms that are required, at least policy-wise, as, as, as substantial. A lot of it comes down to selling the bad debt that the government's got on the SOEs. And sure. to liberalize the sure. economy. So the path okay, to development is th th there. This is abstract. You're thinking as if you're already in power. What I'm saying is, the question that you keep avoiding is, how do you get anyone who wants this into power in South Africa? And your, your answer is, everyone must just vote correctly. Magically, somehow, people must just become rational. No, they people can also aren't rational. Engaged. People can also engage in public debate, which I always encourage. That's a democratic argument. People can protest. They have a right to do that. Okay. There's more than one avenue to changing the system, okay? And it will become from will probably become as sure. a result of public pressure. And my belief is the ANC will probably be the first to implement these changes because the writing is on the wall. Not because they want to, but because they have to. And that will be a repudiation of the ideology. And that will be their lesson to learn. Yeah, you, but that's assuming that they are not levels of existence that they're willing to tolerate. And not not, not, not Ramaphosa of his rich cars, no ways. He's not prepared to go. That's what him. I'm saying is people who are in power like that, they can crush the rest of the country in order to stay cushy. They can. They can do a lot they of things. Do they cannot do a lot of things. I mean, this is just speculation. Um, honestly, I've heard the end of the world before. I'm not seeing it. I'm not saying South Africa is in a great place because that will be you know, lying about the situation. But I do think that path to reform is still sensible. And I see no reason why I need to split my family to change the economic system of a country. Why um, would you be splitting your family? You'd be... Some of the in the Western I Cape. mean, like, you already... No, but I'm saying you already live in a separate country from your family. Yeah, but I go back to visit them quite a lot. I actually, and I still engage with Okay, and? So I, and? And I might and? even still move back there if I if it works out economically. But what's... So, no. But this is the thing. You visit other countries. I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to see the real issue here. So for you, it's all personal. Like, okay, there's a little bit of paperwork I have to fill out. And everything else for you is sort of an ad hoc argument that's based on um, your perspective that South Africa cannot go wrong. Um, it's kind of shitty, but who cares? Um, and my position is that for those of us living in the Cape, we can make it better. We can actually provide us uh, provide ourselves with the opportunity to produce a country that has the capacity for five, <coughs> five, six percent annual GDP growth rate. We, it's it's not impossible. In fact, it's well within uh, the realm of realism for this part of the world. Um, not only that, but we'll will provide a system that has no racial discrimination. That's not hard, okay? It's it, it, This is the one part of the country where racial discrimination, you know, one way or the other, is considered morally wrong. Everywhere else in the country, it is not considered morally wrong. And there is nobody... You, your, uh, your, your insistence that reform is the way... All of those reforms are great ideas, and I completely agree with you, but there is nobody who is going to push that. 
there is nobody who's going to push that. Um, well, they just I, don't exist. No, there are people pushing some things. I mean, and again, I think economic reality will push it. You know, the IMF is waiting for South Africa's debt to GDP to buy them and the grade to be downgraded again. They'll be like, okay, we're going to bail you out under certain well, that's conditions. That's assuming they go to the IMF. Oh, that's assuming the they go to the IMF. The Chinese don't want to give us money anymore. I mean, um, no. I mean, as don't to the they? Point that... they they just gave us they just gave us a massive bailout during COVID. What are no. you talking about? That's, that's their loss if they're dumb enough to do that. Um, okay, but then that changes that changes the, the the substance of your argument, because they don't have to appeal to the IMF who've got these liberal restructuring uh, agreements. They can appeal to the East, who are going to make claims on our mineral resources, on uh, and on our transport networks. Okay, um, that is that's the, the model that China has. Right, not so not IMF... necessarily. Wait a minute. That's that's not even that's that's a bit far away. The Chinese development in Africa has actually brought. It's far away. It's far yeah, away. Far okay, away so... um, but I, do I don't mind. I mean, if, if no, I mean the development that China has brought to some places of Africa has been better in many cases than IMF policy. So I don't mind that. But I mean, that's an option. I mean, what again? My point is that you're asking for economic reform now. By the way, as to the point you make earlier about me leaving the country, yes, it is true that I stay in Paris at the moment. Um, I do move back and forth to South Africa. I go to the Middle East often as well. Um, I live semi-quote-unquote international, at least my personal life, but my family is still back there. I still have an interest in the people living there, and I don't want okay. you know to see them to see them fail. So I would make these arguments to that. Why would they fail if this happens? Uh, because again, you'll split the family in two, and one family is in the north of South okay. Africa, so theoretically they'll lose economically speaking. But uh, can't they move to the Western Cape? I mean, why yeah. would you want to move? Just... Why want to? Why want to move to your home? That sounds like forced migration. <laughs> no, well, who's forcing anyone why to do you anything? Do no, I mean, you're I, saying I mean... South Africa is going to be fine, so then why wouldn't they just remain? Well, either way, if you split off a, a province of South Africa like the Western Cape, that makes a sizable part of the economy, not the biggest part, it must be said. Um, there's going to be economic pain on both sides of it. Okay, um, and that's a net loss for everyone. So why do you want to do that? Because it will make it will make life absolutely and empirically better in the Western Cape. And what you're suggesting is that no country is entitled to pursue its own economic interests. Well, Western Cape's not if a country. That's and it's how you're arguing. Begin with. Western Cape's not a country. It's part well, of okay. They South Africa. The act. They're not the Catonians. act of pushing. <clears throat> no, that's I'm not, true. I'm not, I'm not a Lampopan. I, I don't even know if that's a word. You know. No, no, no. But you know what I'm saying. You, I mean, you do understand what I'm saying, right? No, I, I mean, they like saying okay. Yeah, no, no, no. You, you do understand it, right? What? I mean, you, you, you're making look. You're making a semantic argument, okay? But you understand the substance of my assertion, right? The, that there's a geographical you know, area with its own identity, which I dispute. I don't think there is a separate identity. And well, I think it's an, the thing it's is, an attempt, it's an attempt to create a, a pseudo identity to run away from the actual problems in South Africa. Okay, but what identities are real or not real? How do you define that? Well, I would say South Africa as a construct has been in existence since 19, what's it, 1902. Okay. So South African it, identity, the there's subgroups seeds, within that. It is real. Right? So if the oh, case succeeds, I, I, I then it is real. Well, you first have to argue. And you're that saying that it shouldn't do it. it. It shouldn't do it because it hasn't done it. That's the that's the entire substance of your argument. No, I, I'm saying it, it's 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 senseless to create a new construct, okay, and just to get people to succeed. I think it's a pointless oh, okay. play on so identity it's, to it's, just tied to a geographic location, and that's it. Right. So the United States should not have seceded from um, the United Kingdom because they're English. Um, I, I have no strong opinion on the American Revolution. Um, I would say no, 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 Canada no, 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 no. was much better, no, but no. yeah. No, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm not asking you to have a strong opinion. I'm asking you to have to, to, to just observe like a simple fact uh, I mean, here, you're that... asking, the United States succeeded, that's a fact. Um, they thought they were independent. They also had a war of independence, 
which is what I'm right. trying to avoid here. Um, I think people need to think of wars of independence. There's far more of mm -hmm. them than you know peaceful devolutions. Um, mm -hmm. And that's true. You know, so that's that's a true possibility that can break out. You can avoid that. And I'm saying okay. is the different the reason for the United States succeeding its war independence. A lot of it has to be domination from the UK, un unjust laws, things of that sort. Um, the okay. laws that apply to the Western Plate apply to the rest of South Africa as well. They're not unique. Right. Okay? The economic condition of the Western Cape is probably a little bit better given historical development and a better government. I've said that before. Yes. Um, but I don't think that it's got a separate identity and I don't think it's got even, um, you, you've got no right to impose that onto the rest of South Africa. Which is what essentially what you're saying. Wait, wait, you're so, saying to the South Africans who so, identify themselves that way, they have to become part of the Western Cape now. But that's like saying that Scotland shouldn't be allowed to succeed because that's imposing English nationalism on the English. Well, Scottish decision. Or is a joke it's anyways. it's wrong. No, no, no. But it's no. Th th but that's a separate question entirely. Whether or not it's happening or not is it, is neither here nor there for the point that you're making. You're saying that. Um, the country that succeed, secedes has no say in whether they secede. Only the people who dominate them have that say. Um, but you're making that's that's where you're wrong because it's not the Western Cape is not being dominated by South Africa at the moment. Yes, the it Western is. Cape is part of South Africa. Absolutely, you, it is. Absolutely, like saying, and but then the north, then the northwest is being dominated by South Africa. Then Limpopo is being dominated. But <laughs> Natal is being dominated. You know, okay. you, you can Pretoria well, has been yeah. nominated. You could, yes, you could make nominated. that argument, except except for a very, very simple and obvious fact that all of those provinces vote for the ANC. The DA votes for a government that doesn't want anything to do with them. Well, okay, no, they don't vote in the same. And that's a very the strong ANC indicator. And... Wait, wait a minute. There's a very that's, strong. In... That is a very strong indicator wrong. that there's something completely different. Wait, wait a minute. Go KZN on. has voted for a different government in the past, and they almost they, they their proportion is not the same as Northwest. Um, okay. And I as believe well was the Zulus should secede as well. It would be perfect. It would be in their interest to secede as well. And what about Gauteng? Because they were very close to swinging to the eight one stage. They're close to fifty percent. So, so you know that's the well, cosmopolitan area again. My argument look, if, is if Gauteng, if, look, if Gauteng could agree on uh, on something like that, I'd say all for it. But I don't think that's going to happen. Oh, sorry, South Africa. And then you, you run into other practical problems. Look, if they well. wanted to secede, if they really mm -hmm. wanted to secede and they could get it done, then they should. Yeah, that's, but, uh, th that's my opinion everywhere. Okay, so people should just draw circles until there's no more circle to be drawn. It's simply a matter of, is it in your interest and can you get it done? Those are the only questions you should ask. Okay, and the and answer to both those questions is no and no. No, I disagree. And but but you know what the thing is, let's here's one thing here. We've been talking about independence. The topic of this debate actually was about the People's Bill. Now the People's Bill is about devolution. Now I don't think that you would argue, I mean at least I don't think you're unreasonable enough to argue that devolution would be bad, like that the DA, for example, being in control of Western Cape policing would be worse than the ANC being in charge. That the DA being in charge of Western Cape transport would be worse than the ANC being in charge. And so on. Right? You wouldn't yeah, argue that. I, I would I would I I have would argue, and I think I've argued in some previous podcasts that um those rights I'm not sure about policing because that's a bit, you know, militaristic power, but yeah, some a lot of responsibility can be devolved to the okay. can be devolved to the provinces. When it comes to police and right. military and the legalization of force, then you run into technical domination issues, um, okay, and you can have fine. a reaction. No, but, I understand yeah. that, but I, but I agree. No, I understand that. Metro police should have more rights to raise people. I'm, I'm for that. Right. So what well, I'm well, saying well, here. Well, 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 let me just. Uh, you're not sure, but they should have more power to raise people. Can you just? Well, if you look at the definition of a state, it's the monopoly on violence, right? So as soon as yeah. you start giving the policing powers to the provinces in full. Um, you start creating a separate political entity, um, which is clo one close step closer to secession. So when it comes to the monopolization of violence, things of that sort, it's a very difficult argument to make that full power should be given to the provinces. I would say that, for example, does it, for example, the United States have policing powers in the states or even at a local level? 
Yeah, but they have certain powers devolved as well. I mean, I'm not I'm not against devolving some powers, yeah. but you need to be very careful. So what I'm saying is, yeah. let's say you can have like a, a, the um, state police of Texas or Louisiana or Rhode Island. You can have the state police of the provincial police of the Western Cape. Yeah. And I think that's some, perfectly fine. Something comparable to that, I right. would say, in, in principle, yeah. Sure. So, so that the SAPS becomes a federal police and we get our own provincial police. That's fine. Why not? So what I'm saying is we pass this bill, okay? We use the international treaties to leverage the power in the constitutional court to gain control of the areas that we want to gain control of. That's the only measure we have really left. Because look, I've done I've done fairly extensive research. There's, there's some areas where you can gain some control back, you know, electricity, some, some aspects of water. But ultimately, it's really, really, really painful, difficult, and requires cooperation of central government on the majority of issues, right? And some of them, the central government has final say on everything. So here we have an opportunity to sign a bill into, into law in the Western Cape that allows us to leverage our declaration of being separate from South Africa in our interests and in our character, which obviously that's true. Character, Look, yeah. everyone in South Africa says that the Western Cape is different. You've you've got an uh, you've got a you've got to be in Sorry, your bonnet, Rob, so you don't want to that statement. Come there. Qualif you're saying everyone. How do you know that? Well, I, I'm not everyone. So no, no, everyone Rob, except yeah, me. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I know. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good but point. Look, it's it's it, it's an extremely it, look. Only, um, this is anecdotal, so feel free to dismiss it. But it's. Like, so you've been to Kazanin, you've been to Limpopo, you've been to the Northwest. Yeah, I, I've been to. Yeah, all look, I've provinces. been to those places. Uh, everyone who's so been, you, yeah, but you, you to spoke both to all places. those people, and they all agree on the point well, that the Western Cape is different. Yeah, it's qualitatively different from the rest of the country. And look, um, it's I, I don't a see a big difference. Wait, I sort of see a big difference between the Northern Cape and, and the Western Cape and the parts of the Free State. Uh, oh. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I would say like, I, I don't. See, I sort of see a big a difference. I don't see a big difference between Pretoria and um, you know Cape Town in many aspects. So no, they've got, both got mountains. They both have a university. They both have people living in them. Um, you know, it's just another, another city. There's nothing. Yeah, special it's like about. saying there's well, there's no difference between there's no real difference between you know um, Tokyo and Khartoum. You know, they they they're both big conurbations. Um, uh, Khartoum has two rivers. Right. Yeah. So. It it just seems to me a bit of a, a disingenuous point. I mean, the culture's f uh, fairly different. Yeah, there's plenty of similarities. Oh, really? Then... Uh, 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 what, is, what is the difference between the culture of Afrikaners living in the Western Cape and Afrikaners living in Pretoria? I would love to know that answer. There's no difference. I mean, cultures, no difference? Are, scattered, the cultures are scattered all over. Oh, the colors living in the Cape and the hmm. colors living in Esteros, Pretoria. What is the difference there? I mean, I, I see culturally, if you, if you define culture by ethnic group, you know. Well, what's the difference between the Volga Germans living in Russia in uh, 1930 and the Germans living in, you know, Berlin at the same time? Not a big difference, except they speak Russian in Russia. <laughs> Probably, right. I think I and think so, some of them even so, didn't. But yeah. Okay, so now we're getting now we're getting somewhere. So that would be like saying that Russia and Germany should have been one country because there are some common ethnic groups scattered between them. Wait a minute, you, you had a German diaspora who settled in Russia, and you're trying to compare that to the Western mm -hmm. Cape that historically has always been part of South Africa, where people have moved back and forth towards. Historically always has always of, been. Um, since the Union of South Africa, the Western Cape was one of right. the Right, and so what South happened Africa. after the Union of South Africa? Uh, what happened with the Union of South Africa three years afterwards? Mm, what, you, you had the Union, you had some parliament form, if I remember correctly. Go on, I... You had the Land yeah, Act. You had massive geographical segregation. Yes, and? Yes, and? South Africa. And, uh, and those South areas, even, the, and even those, those areas, South Africa tried to separate those areas. They'd always stayed part of South Africa, even though they tried to pretend it wasn't. Okay, but that's not my point. It's not about political suzerainty. It's about differences of culture in geographical areas. Um, so what you're saying is that the exertion is that whatever happened in '94 
magically made all of South Africa equivalent in all of their areas in their ethnic makeup and yeah. somehow well yeah. I, I don't think any of those saying? ethnic divides have ever been so uh, based on why those, on the four provinces historically speaking based on the homelands there was some attempt at doing that but that's a bit different and simultaneously south africa was unity and diversity that used to be the quote that everyone was throwing around mm -hmm. at the time if they've got about it so you've got diversity you've got a complex uh, I, you've got complex identities because south africa is a post-colonial society um okay. that's what we call south africa and if and the cape secedes so yeah. if the cape secedes are you going to recommend uh reunification mm, well I, I've, I would have to see what the options are on the table because I would like to avoid violence to begin with. Um, but I would encourage the Western Cape not to go to begin with because they, again, they are historically part of South Africa. Um, they they have, there is no, sorry, but this, this idea of trying to create a Western Cape identity doesn't exist. It's a pseudo identity. It's a, it's a new fad that is, uh, that, that came why, on the internet. Well, so is, so is, so is the United States. So is, the, so is Scotland. So is well, pretty much any modern nation. Yeah, but the, and, the, there's no need. There's and then no the question becomes: the, there is definitely a need for it, and this is the issue. You still haven't demonstrated any way in which South Africa can ever reform. And if they continue on their current trajectory, they will become bankrupt. And as you have admitted, if that happens, there will be widespread ethnic violence. Depend, it depends how the bankruptcy we roll and how the country restructures and oh, okay. there's, there's a lot of factors to, so, to say we're going to go violent. Okay. So you're saying that there's a very significant chance that South Africa staying together will result in mass ethnic violence in South Africa and that we ought to take that risk even though there's no option of fixing it. Oh, there is but, an option, as I've said. So that's okay, a how, no, 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 no. You still haven't. You still haven't. You still haven't. You've said that if by magic, if by ma sheer magic, the people in power decide to change every aspect of their belief system, Not every aspect. then it will be okay. I, I would like for them to change many aspects, but generally it comes down to economic policy. I mean, if they go back to economic policy that Becky had, which was reasonable, wasn't perfect by any means, because they also started a lot of nonsense under gear, you know, the economy will have some growth. You, you don't need significant reform to begin with. See now the problem. So with, uh, I'm not uh, asking for the ANC to adopt well, okay, I'm not asking the for the ANC to adopt new religion. Policy. <laughs> no, but look, Mbeki's economic policy was really um, burning the economic reserves to pay off the debt, right? It was getting rid of debt, and he was still riding the economic growth uh, that, that resulted from the foreign direct investment uh, driver that emerged after apartheid when the market opened up. But there's no real substantive difference between his model and the current model. There was massive social spending, massive uh, control of state-owned enterprises. There's no real substantive difference between Mbeki and now, except that we no longer have the capital that we had back then. There was liberalization of and the, all the market. I beg your pardon? There was liberalization. Sorry, I just didn't hear. There was liberalization of the market to the point that Zapiro at one stage drew a picture of Mbeki as the next Margaret Thatcher, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and he actually. Yes, he no, I know. I've, I've heard socialists but... saying this. I've heard socialists saying yeah, this. Yeah, and, and there's evidence really that the economy was growing. Now, I, I'm not saying Mbeki was a golden era because his policy in Zimbabwe is, was no. enough to, for contempt, okay? And we are, thanks he... to him, we have those migrants at the moment, which we also no, try no, to. Forget absorb. Zimbabwe. Forget Zimbabwe. This is not what we're talking about. We're no, talking what, I'm, about... what I'm saying is that s s subtle changes in ANC policy can result in some economic growth. It might not be six or three or no. four percent that you want, but it would be some growth. It's, and it's, there are it's signs. It's possible because the changes, changes that need to be made are radical. The changes that need no, to be made are that. radical. No, no look, what, what is radical we, about expanding electricity? That's not a radical policy. The that's amount of money it would policy. cost is uh, is what the amount of money it would cost. Which is why the ANC has to open it up for private sector investment at the moment. And there's a lot of I money. I work, in electricity sure. energy. I work in the energy sector. I'm one of these guys who can't work for ESCOMs. I find work outside of the country, which is a disgrace in itself. Um, 
you know, the I know people in the energy sector mm. that will put a lot of money down tomorrow if there's enough policy and guarantee for the investment. Okay, and they will come with your pico gas plant and your solar panel and even a nuclear plant if they have to whatever solution you want to pick up, and they can solve the electricity problem in South Africa. And I asked one of the big bankers the other day the question, how long can South Africa have it? And he said, if you have the right policy in place, it takes three to five years, okay, before you're sort of more or less okay. Okay, it takes three years to turn an electrical system around. That's what South Africa needs at the moment. Now, to tell the Minister of Energy we need electricity, he already understands that. He doesn't understand, or he understands the private sector needs to do it, but doesn't want to admit it at this stage. That is the biggest stumbling block. Okay. That doesn't sound to me like a Marxist revolution. Or whatever mm. revolution people mm. are proposing, it's just yeah. expanding electricity. Why is it radical? But, sure. Yeah, but it seems to but, me like but, the, but the, the, the reason, the reason, the reason, the reason why they wouldn't do that is they're making a lot of money from the corruption of ESCO. There's um, that reason, and there's ideological blockage as well, and they go together with the corruption, right? Sure. Yes. I mean, they, they can uh, make they can make money. Shape of it. That they can no, steal money off the private sector as well if they want to. And I, I'm okay with them stealing a bit of the private sector at this stage just to have electricity. <laughs> okay. No, 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 <laughs> that would be great. Right. But it's it's about the specific shape of the corruption, right? So if it was just like, you know, a few static gatekeepers that you have to pay off, fine. But the way it works is that you've got several different factions in the ANC, right? And everybody who's got any say has specific stable revenue sources from within the state-owned enterprises. If you were going to switch over to a rapid transformation process, you'd have to cut huge sectors out, um, out of stable revenue sources for the foreseeable future. Now, the problem with that is the second you attempt that, you're going to see um, a massive loss of power within the ANC. You're going to see a huge destabilization, which is why they don't, trans they don't transform. Yeah, because basically people have to take their hands out of the cookie jar. Power. And the, you, no, 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 it's not, it's, it's not just it. that. Yeah, okay, that's that's a bit more accurate. So you you have a very stable system which works on sharing access to stable corrupt revenue steam, streams, right? And in order to change that, you're going to need someone who can exert enough force to suppress any challenges to power that would come if that system was disrupted. Now, that kind of power does not come from political coalitions, okay? It doesn't come from, I mean, look, give you an example, like, like look at the coalitions that are going on in like Johannesburg, Pretoria, whatever, Nelson Mandela Bay. Like you've seen how that works out. These are not strong governments. These are weak, yeah, fragile this systems. This is the nature of a democracy. This is, this is not different. Right, than... no, 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 sure. It's the nature of democracy. I'm not disputing that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this is what we have. Okay, we, and, we still have, and, wait a minute, we, we still have a state in South Africa and we still have some judicial system that is relatively independent, okay, that is still can still exercise a monopoly on violence and you can enforce the laws if you change the regulation. Again, all that South Africa has to again, do is change a few regulations. Point. I'm, I'm so, okay. no, gentlemen, I'm, gentlemen, you, gentlemen, no, gentlemen. You're saying we have to change the regulations. I'm gentlemen. saying how do we do this? And no. there's always just nothing. Yeah, there's no way to I, change. I, I, I think I think Rob, you need a little bit more optimism, and you need to be stop being so desperate and revolutionary in your thinking. It doesn't okay. get us anywhere, and those type of thinkings have never changed any system. Just we need to sensibly reform the system. And I accept in South Africa, I can't change it at the moment. I can make the argument. If people don't listen, well, you know. I, I do something else until they start listening. And I make the argument again and again. As I say, the argument is simple for me. You need sensible economic reform. That seems unlikely from where I am. I agree with you there. But I don't see it impossible. I don't see it impossible the ANC would even act on that. Because even this Minister of Electricity, whatever that means, is, is, is trying to, to talk in that direction. And, you know, so I, I'm far more optimistic about the changes possible. One guy they asked in the comments, where did I study? Um, yeah, I, I studied at the... University of Pretoria, and then I went to the Col Special de Republic in France. So, with South African and France, and now I've been here. Fantastic. Okay, gentlemen, we need to go to sleep. And this has been really amazing. This has been fantastic. Okay, to summarize this debate, to give you closing, to give you a closing argument opportunity. It seems to me, like Yuhu is saying, we do have the time, and the, they are the people that are willing to make the changes we need to make. And Robert is saying we don't have the time. And there are no 
representatives. There's no example of people that are willing to make the changes we need to make. That's why we need Cape Secession. So, Ihu, closing statements, whatever you want to say, this is now your opportunity. If if you want to perhaps clarify my point or yeah, def- no, that, that that's so well. Okay, that's that sort of sums up my position. It's just I'm uh, I'm generally an optimist, generally speaking of the human condition so i think societies across the world along if you take a long term view are getting better on every measurable index you can find um so I, I don't see why south africa is an exception to that i think part of the problem is south africans thought that they're an exceptional country in 1994 and i think that reality has to be sort of mm-hmm. gotten rid of south africa is no different the type of development and the type of frustrations that people experience i see it in other developing countries across the world as well. Again, I've been to 34 countries. I work across the world. And you're seeing the exact same questions. I just came back from a month visit in Iran. Same questions that the Iranians are having. Their government is you know, quasi-democratic, less democratic than ours, but they're asking middle-class aspirations. The same in Brazil. You find the same in Egypt, again, in the Middle East. Um, so we are there. We're in that league of countries. And I think we need to make the mental shift a way to think that we are where the Europeans are in terms of development, because that was unrealistic to achieve in 1994, right? So South Africa is a developing country, and we have all the economic and social economic problems of developing countries, including a lot of corruption. I can take you to other countries in the world and show you just as much corruption and frustration with the political process in South Africa. And guess what? I can show you countries that have gotten through it. And a lot of it comes down to, again, as I said earlier, people have to move to cities, people start urbanizing. And it's usually the urban population that carries the society forward. Another country I'm optimistic about is Zimbabwe, and we can speak about that next time. Yeah. Hmm. No, I Robert, actually, it's it's interesting. Wait, wait, it's interesting. Just, that, yeah, yeah, no, no. Just, I, I, final statements. Yeah, but I think no, it's, it's actually just, weird. just to answer his question as well. He's just interested in your vape flavor. And just to clarify, I've just been chewing on a toothpick. But you can you can answer yeah, that in your it's own time. Peach ice. It's peach ice. I like the ones that have got a little bit of menthol in them. Um, anyway, um, but it's 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 interesting that uh, Hugo uh, departed on Zimbabwe. I actually kind of agree with him because Zimbabwe has hit rock bottom. They're not going to go any further down, and they, um, you know, they've had, you know, uh, if I speak to people from Zimbabwe nowadays, it's sort of everyone's going. Look, if you've got enough capital, and it's not much, if you've got like fifty thousand rand, you know. You can make hand over fist over there if you're on the ground and you've got decent contacts, right? And it generally seems to be the, the, the message. He says, if you haven't got capital, you're screwed. But if you do have capital and you have, you keep your political opinions to yourself, it's it's great. You can you can make headway. And not just black, black Zimbabweans, but white Zimbabweans as well. So, um, sure. But the thing is, I, I, don't, I don't really want to pass through that narrow part of the cavern that that Zimbabwe has gone through um and <laughs> so I mean like I, I look at South, I, like obviously South Africa is not going to go the way of Zimbabwe it's not going to look the same we're a different country we've got our own little things going on um but that doesn't mean that bad things can't happen and I think I think people are underestimating the risks at the moment um and I think, it, look, it's very hard to read because anyone who looks at Sol Ramaphosa, you see some of the things where he says a lot of things about liberal reform and then he talks to the other side of the party and he says, yes, but these communist measures and these sort of imitations of, uh, of the Far East. But I think, I think in terms of the shift that's happening geopolitically, um, they are leaning further to the East now, especially since you know, BRICS, the, the several institutions that make it up are expanding now. Um, you know, peace in the Middle East between Iran and Saudi Arabia, um, Egypt making its way into uh, into the agreement, South Africa looking to consolidate its position. Um, it, it gives a lot of policymakers in the ruling party and in other parties that want to compete with the ANC or collaborate with it. It gives them confidence in, how should I say, less prudent plans. And I think um, it doesn't often work out well in the long term for countries that go in this direction. And looking at our human development, in uh, our sort of potential human development, like our education system, it's not good. It's 
the it's one of the worst and most inefficient in the world ever um in the modern world um and you know we talk about sort of possibilities for political change i mean you know where's the alternative political elite that's waiting to do sensible things in south africa they're not there it's not about you know a lot of countries a lot of countries that hugo talks about they do have a waiting alternative elite that have a position that's willing to exploit big exceptions but again the kind of exceptions that they get to exploit are massive violent dangerous ones um and you know the question is you know which way are you going to which way are you going to go i mean it's it's going to take extraordinary amounts of nasty violence to change what's happening in south africa one way or the other there's no peaceful solution to what we have and i think as long as we're gambling for a risk what i'd like is a country in which the ethnic minority that i'm a, a part of if i'm going to live as an ethnic minority in in, in the country i'm in i'd like and that minority to be big <laughs> yeah but i'd like that minority to be big enough that it can't simply be disregarded politically and the only place that you can really find that is in the western cape so i think for my money it's either direction is a massive gamble on the future of well not just me and my family but everyone else so i look at it and i go look i'm willing to try for this because it looks like a future at which i'm not going to I, i'm going to have to worry far less about whether or not my children or my grandchildren have a future here than otherwise and i think that for the sake of other people like myself you know whether they're white or colored or indian you know if you if you just take the position of like well you know whatever let's just become international cosmopolitans drift from one place to another i don't know if everyone, uh, it, it it just seems kind of if everyone uh, not everyone can take that position and you know someone has someone has to be the idiot who takes the stupid moral stance and i don't know why why not let it be me if if that's what's going to happen Oh, come on, Rob. You're not a stupid idiot. Well, good for that. Um, if you want to try it, a lot of people would it. disagree. By all means, pursue it. Um, I, I just think you're wasting your time, and there are better avenues. But that's your choice. And um, yeah. yeah, I would say thanks for the chat. People can follow me, by the way. I've got my own YouTube channel and Substack, and I'm on Twitter. So I just have to add the ad for myself. In. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, yeah. I you can probably found it by just searching Ihu Career. Yes, with the two yeah. dots on the US. Umlaut deal tickets. Yeah. Go do not drop. forget the umlauts uh and uh yeah um l lest anybody think that we're very angry with each other it's it's um look of course i, I i'm a very emotional character but um yeah no hugo's got a lot of good things to say on many topics um a little bit more conspiratorial than me in some ways um which is a turning the table i think when we first met you accused me of being a conspiracy theorist um <laughs> But um, yeah, no, uh, do definitely follow Hugo. He's got a lot of positive things, contributions. Um, and for what it's worth in this conversation, as frustrated as I did get with him, I think um, he argues far more intelligently about this uh, it, it, on this side of the argument than anyone else, really. Um, and so, yeah, definitely follow him. And if you want to follow me, uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Substack and I'm on YouTube, <laughs> the same platforms. Um, but uh, best place to find me because it's the only one I'm under my own name is Twitter. And so that's Robert Digan, D-U-I-G-A-N. And uh, yeah, all my other stuff is linked from there. Um, yeah. Great. Right. Awesome, guys. Thank you for this great discussion, this battle of ideas. Thank you for your time. This is awesome. It was really awesome. And I think our viewers enjoyed as well. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And let me end it. All right. <laughs>